Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. I'm your host, Sergio Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today and let the experience begin. This episode is brought to you by Sports Business Classroom, an immersive sports business training and educational experience dedicated to preparing future sports business professionals. It is a one of a kind learning opportunity for those interested in the business of basketball and jobs in sports. Sports Business Classroom combines the best of all worlds into a single package. Great academics, hands-on experience, immersion in the Las Vegas Summer League, and interaction with some of the best minds working in and around the NBA. For more information about Sports Business Classroom, go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. This episode is also brought to you by Hall Pass Media, a full-service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. For more information on Hall Pass Media, go to hallpassnetwork.com. Today's guest is my good friend and mentor, Jeff Fellinser. Jeff is an incredibly versatile and experienced sports business professional with more than three decades of experience in sports management, news media, higher education, and as an entrepreneur. Reading Jeff's list of accomplishments would take a very long time, but to paint a picture, he's a Heisman Trophy voter He's one of the most popular professors at the University of Southern California. He's a sports business entrepreneur and a mentor to many. Jeff is a frequent media commentator and has been quoted in many different media publications, including Sports Illustrated, The New York Times, The LA Times, The Associated Press, Forbes.com, and MSNBC.com. Jeff has a relationship with many of the top names in the business of sports, including Jerry West, Bill Walton, Pete Carroll, Al Michaels, Scott Boris, Jeannie Buss, and George Raveling, just to name a few. Without further ado, I give you the wise and inspiring Jeff Fellinser. Well, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you so for, so much for being here. My pleasure. Um, you're a dear, dear friend of mine. I'm going to be honest. I struggled on the, when I was thinking about how we were going to get this thing going. So why don't we start off with, you know, just how we met. Um, I remember it well. Uh, It was the year that I took over as the faculty advisor at USC for the Sports Business Association, which comes out of the Marshall School. And you were uh, in your senior year and you had taken over as president of the Sports Business Association. So now I am I am taking over as the faculty advisor, getting to know the people who run the group and it was you and I think Kunal I think um, Kunal yeah Kunal Kunal Katani Katani was 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 with you and I just remember during the course of the time during your senior year and my first year uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a fun parallel because obviously a big time for you senior year of college and it was sort of an extra duty as I was starting to add them um in the fall of 2007, uh, becoming more involved uh, at USC. And I remember thinking, you know, this guy is so sharp and beyond that is such a, uh, has such a strong work ethic and he's got such great character and um, he's got uh, goals and sort of a vision for wanting to accomplish something in the world of, of sports business, not even sure necessarily what, but just that you were going to be an achiever. And I thought, if I ever get a chance to work with this guy again, as he goes out and becomes a professional, I will do that. And I didn't let much time pass before we started to work together on a project. Um, and the more Time went by, the more I, I brought you in as often as I could on projects and was happy to introduce you to people in my world because I knew you would impact them and they you. And it's just grown from there. And it 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 has all just evolved very organically, very naturally. The friendship and the, you know, the professional elements for both of us, you've been extraordinarily valuable to me in in various things that I have done, projects, and 
And if I've been able to help in some way for for you to, you know, get to somewhere you needed to get to or achieve something, then uh, I feel like it's been a great win-win. And, and leading up to me being able to to perform the the uh, the services at your uh, at your wedding, which I'll never forget. Yeah, no, an amazing so, experience. The officiant at my wedding. Yeah. And uh, I actually just realized the other day when doing some research for this podcast that uh, we're made reference to. Our wedding is actually made reference to on the Annenberg website. I told my wife that the other day. She absolutely loved that. Why shouldn't it be? That was yeah. that was a, that was a pleasant surprise. Um, so you've been teaching here at USC for how many years now? Well, I started teaching a sports reporting class in the spring of 1990 as an adjunct. I was working at the LA Times. The professor who hired me and gave me the opportunity was a gentleman named Ed Cray. Had a great career as a journalist, author, professor at Annenberg, and um, I will be forever indebted to Ed Cray. I, I bring his name up specifically because he passed away just a couple of weeks ago in his 80s. He was a dynamo, um, a guy that just had great presence. I never, I'll never forget he hired me and he said, I don't care if you have your students stand up on their desks and read Greek poetry. Whatever you need to do, do. And I never forgot that because... I'm sure he was happy to hear that I wasn't doing that. I wasn't teaching about uh, the uh, sports journalism and reporting and writing by having the students stand on their desks and um, and learn uh, Greek and poetry. But I think his point was whatever you need to do to to get them to reach the goals you set were behind you. And I've always felt when I talk about how much I've enjoyed teaching is, especially on the college level, I know it's different at, at, at different levels leading up to college, but that um, I really appreciate the fact that you've got a great deal of autonomy, especially if you're teaching a class, an elective class, where mm -hmm. you're not required to get certain amounts of information across to students. But, y y you know, I can, I can teach a class the way that I think will most benefit the students. So that's why with my classes, it's very hands-on. There's not a textbook. It's about, it's readings that are topical, relevant. And, and I, you know, I want to share my, my expertise, my experience, and also my network. Mm -hmm. I want them to meet people that I think will be a great voice for them to hear as they build begin to build their network because I built mine. I started building mine at USC and um, through my classes, through guests I met in my classes. Valuable lesson right there. Very valuable lesson. I, 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 I just felt like, I feel like since we're in this vibrant marketplace, this intersection of sports and entertainment and business in Southern California, and and I'm proud to have and blessed to have what I think is is a uh, is a great network of friends and colleagues that have really enjoyed the experience of coming to my classes and giving back to the students. And I'm forever indebted. I always say I can't give them much more than a maybe an Annenberg mug or a or a notebook or you know a hat. Um, what I can give them is an opportunity to meet my students mm -hmm. and a chance to connect with them. And I have been so overwhelmed at times by the generosity of those people to take time to come to my class when they don't walk away with anything, but maybe they do. Maybe they walk away knowing- I think they, they do. Maybe they walk away knowing that they've had a chance to impact some people young people. And because I always say we all had people, whatever amount of success you've had at this point in your life, especially in sports where it's, it's such a small world, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's really a pretty small world. I always say in my world, forget the Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation. It's closer to two and closer to one than three from two uh, of separation. So y you you know, 
if you can begin to build that network, it's um, I think that can be a, a, a great takeaway from my class. And I think for the guests, it's knowing that they were able to help students just as someone helped them. So it, there's a whole lot of good karma mm -hmm. and give back involved. And I hear, I hear the people you, you would admire the most in sports say that a lot. And I realize, you know, I think anybody that is lucky enough to work in any profession that where it feels less like a job than it does a calling that you would feel that way. So it's, that's, so that's where it started for me that spring of 90, the class that. And before you go on, before yeah. you go on, I do want to mention some of those names. We've got John Wooden, Jerry West, Pete Carroll, Al Michaels, Larry Scott, Jeannie Buss, Casey Wasserman, and our mutual friend George Raveling, just to name a few. Just to name a few. So those are, um, as you said, those are, those are good, you know, those are good friends and people that haven't, didn't hesitate. Coach Wooden came three different times to the class. I think they were life-changing in each case. Uh, it's the feedback I got from students. That's what I was feeling on the stage. Um, it's the place where uh, John Wooden met Pete Carroll. And Pete Carroll had wanted to meet Coach Wooden because somebody had given him the book. I call it the blue book. It's just Wooden, a lifetime of observations and reflections uh, on and off the court by Steve Jamison, who wrote several. But the, I think of the first one as the one that uh, kind of has every, all of the, the Woodenisms and all the you know, the, all the observations that I, that I value to this day. And I have a weekly wooden in my class. As Which we're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but Coach Wooden had, uh, or Pete Carroll had wanted to meet Coach Wooden and he had read the book in the year he was out of football after he got fired by the Patriots, but before he was hired at USC. And, um, and so uh, he started off his, his uh, career at USC and obviously had almost instant success. And it was about three years into his tenure here that um, I sent word up to his office. And I hadn't met him yet, Pete Carroll, but I sent word to his office that John Wooden was coming to my class and just said, hey, if I, I, I think he had wanted to meet him at some point and uh, just let him know that we're going to be over there. And it came at a time during a spring that, uh, that they weren't in practice. So, uh, but I didn't hear anything back. I just got, that was it. I didn't hear anything back. And lo and behold, we set up a reception above the auditorium where the class is outside and I look up and at some point um, here comes Pete Carroll. He's got three of his assistant coaches with him, Incredible. including Ken Norton, who was a all America at UCLA. And when coach wouldn't coach wouldn't arrive shortly after that. And he, Kenny, what are you doing over here? <laughs> laughing about it. But the funny thing was, here's the, here's arguably the greatest coach in the history of sports at any level yeah. of any sport. And he was over at USC and uh, the very first time he came to campus, the fellow driving him, Andy Hill, one of his former players and also a good friend, they were driving into an area and they were they had gotten, a, uh, you know, one of the key cards to put in and it raises the arm. But somehow there was a they, they hesitated didn't they didn't go right away. So they started to go through and the arm came down right on the car. That was John Wooden's welcome to USC. There you go. Oh. But he got past that. And, and I think he had a, I think he had a great experience. I know the students did. We talked about it after when we stopped for dinner at the Apple Pan in West LA, across from the West Side Pavilion, an institution, the great hamburgers and just counter, no tables, just counter. Been there since 1948, which was the year that Coach Wooden arrived at UCLA in 1948. So we sort of, we, we kind of tied that all in one, one night, but, um, Anyway, it's been um, that 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 was that stands out particularly. But all of the people that you mentioned, Jerry West will be in the class um, in November this year, in a few weeks, and George Raveling as well. And um, I I I just I get I get just this overwhelming feeling of gratitude whenever any time I have. Uh, guess uh, whenever uh, my friends are able to come by because I know that they will impact the students in a class of anywhere from 75 to 125 
uh, not every guest is going to impact every student every week. Sure. But I think the odds are pretty good that the people that I bring in over the course of the semester at some point will say something that will resonate. And I know the weekly woodens will. Absolutely. And we're going to get into the weekly woodens. But I, I do want to ask you, so where did you get the idea for the class? Like what 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 gave you the idea to have to make the format for the class what it is? And also, what made you believe you could get these people to your class? Um, well, I, I give credit for the original vision of the class to my dear friend and colleague, and we teach a class together, a sports film class together called the Athlete Sports Media and Popular Culture, which is just a couple of years old. I'm, I'm proud of that class. But Professor uh, Joe Saltzman, institution, he's been here over 50 years. He was a documentary filmmaker before he got to USC. And even though Joe, I wouldn't say is a hardcore sports guy, I'd say he's a sports guy that that knows his way around um, a bit, follows it enough to, to be plugged in. And, and, and he came to me one day and just said, um, I was at that point teaching the sports reporting class that Ed Cray hired me to teach, spring of 90, and said, I want to teach a class that that encompasses sports and the business side in addition to the media part of it. Um, I thought, oh, that, sounds, that sounds interesting. Uh, I, I said, do you have any idea? You're the sports guy. Do you have any idea of somebody that could teach it? And I said, um, let me give it some thought. So I would guess maybe a week or two went by. And I remember going back to Joe Saltzman's office and saying, Joe, I've thought about it. And, you know, it what you have in mind kind of encompasses my career, like the media side, working for the LA Times, the business side, launching um, an event, the Pete Newell Challenge, um, being an entrepreneur. It, it sounds like it's like a, a real hybrid of what I have done. Um, he, go, he goes, well, then you teach it. And I said, well, I, I was thinking that might be, a, might be an interesting class to do. Done. Um, and then it was, then I was struck a little while after that, like, oh, what have I, what have I agreed to? I had this nice little, we'd come in a rectangular table. I'd have typically 15 students in my sports reporting class, upper level, usually juniors and seniors. And you knew everybody, you, you had a real easy conversation because you knew everybody so well. And now we're going into this class. We're going to put an auditorium because we're hoping that we get uh, a lot of students interested, but you never know. Teaching a class is like starting a business. You put a shingle out saying we're offering a class and you hope students sign up. We didn't know whether we get 10. But in case we got more, we scheduled for an auditorium and right out of the gate, we were, you know, over 100. And and I ended up uh, recruiting Fred Clare, who I had once worked for when I was a student at USC and doing an internship with the Dodgers, operating the message board, which came before Diamond Vision. Uh, Fred had been recently fired by Fox, which bought the Dodgers from the O'Malley's. And he'd always wanted to teach. And out of the blue, he he got a hold of me because he heard from a mutual friend about this class uh, taking shape and, and called me. And I just said, oh, this is amazing because I had thought that it would be a great idea to have someone teach it with me that had another level of expertise that maybe I didn't have, which in this case was Fred as a longtime general manager of the Dodgers, sure. 30 years in the organization. And it all came together right at the same time. So the spring of 99, so this was all fall of um, 98, and I stopped teaching the smaller class and I began teaching sports business media with Fred Clare. We only taught it in spring because I was busy with my basketball event, the Pete Newell Challenge in the Bay Area in the fall, and I was too busy to teach in the fall. So it began as a spring-only class, and and I felt like I had a pretty good network, and I knew Fred Clare had a great network. Mm -hmm. So a number of the relationships that that I have built on started with Fred Clare. And one of the one of the first ones that comes to mind is Scott Boris, the agent, who's been a a dedicated guest in my class every year. I never ask for more than once a year um, because his schedule is probably the craziest of any of I'm the sure. guests that come to class uh, because there's never an off season. During the season, he's monitoring closely his clients 
And in the off season, he's doing contracts and preparing for arbitration or free agency. And so to get him once a year and he lives in Newport beach. So he makes a pretty good drive to come up. But, um, so it really, it was a matter of, of, you know, having, uh, in this case between Fred and myself, the two of us having pretty good sports networks built up and Fred, especially in baseball. And, uh, so I think it was just asking those people we considered friends if they would like to come to class and share some of their expertise and some of their wisdom. And I, I think, um, I think they've en really enjoyed the experience of of giving back to the students because I think, you know, as I said before, I think we, we all think about how fortunate we are to be working in an industry that, again, I, I think of it more as a calling than I do a job. And so to get into that space, um, I suppose people in the working in the world of entertainment, incredibly hard work. Mm -hmm. But I bet most of them would say it's they think of it more as a calling than a job, something they had to do. And so I think the people that we've had have have enjoyed the experience. I have called them back many times over the years because I've seen the impact that they've had. And I know it's it will continue and it has. And so for your class, I mean, generally do these people, are these people doing presentations? Are you moderating a conversation? I would describe it exactly what you just said, moderating a conversation. Because I never refer to that portion of the class, which typically is the last half of the class. I think it's good to break up and hear a different voice. I don't want to talk for three and a half hours. Right. Uh, I'm still talking, but I don't want to be the, you know, the centerpiece for three and a half hours. It's, it's, it's nice to share um, the, the stage, uh, Fred, Fred, Claire and I taught together for three semesters, spring of 1999, 2000 and 01. And then he got busy with projects, but has continued to be a great supporter and, and friend and mentor. And I've sent many students to him, mm -hmm. uh, that, that one's interested in getting into baseball, especially. Um, so it's me going solo since then, since, um, spring of 2002, uh, so the second half of class is typically when I bring guests in and, and uh, I, I never call them lectures. I always want to refer to what we do as discussions. And then when a guest is there, I, I call them conversations. So um, there's some structure to them because I want to cover material that they may be tested on. Mm -hmm. But it's very much of a conversation. It's, um, and I make it interactive. I don't want them waiting 45 minutes to ask questions. If you have a thought... You want to make a comment, ask a question. I want to see that your hands go up as soon as you have that question. So we keep it interactive. We keep it, I hope, engaging to where they're, you know, because it is, hey, look, it's at night. It's at the end of, for a lot of students, a long day. If they're, you know, there's always at least a handful of athletes in the class and they've finished practicing in some cases if it's their their sports season. And we go till 930 or later. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there, you, you, I think you, I also need to be mindful of what it takes to keep a class engaged for that long. Right. No question. So let, let's let's talk about that. How do you keep your class engaged for that that long? And what's, uh, you know, somebody who's you know new to the podcasting world and yeah. new to questions, yeah. You know, you're obviously an expert at it. You've been doing it for many, many years. You're a master storyteller. Um, in 2014, you were named USC's most inspirational professor. So you're obviously very, very good at what you do. What's the key to asking good questions? Uh, well, thank you for those nice uh, words. Um, I, I think just having a, a basic sense of curiosity, of just wanting to know why, or how. And, and when I started my podcast um, called The Front Row, because that's where I prefer and encourage my students to sit. They can't mm -hmm. all sit there, but I like it if the front row is uh, filled. Um, it because generally I, is. Because I, I, I think you send a good message to a professor that you're there to learn. Because you could go into the back in a big class. We have an auditorium. It's not a it's not a lecture hall. It's, it, it doesn't feel, you've been there. You don't, it doesn't feel like disconnected from the stage. 
it, 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 it's 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 a pretty compact auditorium, but I I uh, I like them to feel like they're connected to what's going on up on stage, and so it's important that they that they don't feel like there's a disconnect. Look, I'm not naive enough to think that when I, a laptop is up that they're not checking on messages or on Facebook or you know the social platforms or in a case of a sports class checking scores, watching a game. Look, I, I mean, growing up, I was probably doodling and writing starting lineups out for the Dodgers or whatever. I was doing kind of this, the same thing. It was just in a different form. Mm -hmm. That's why I never take it personally. Uh, but I'll also recognize if I feel like if there's restlessness or anything like that. Um, I try to keep the the visual thing going in our turn. We have a, have a big screen. For years, I hardly ever used it. And then it I realized, you know, why aren't you using that to tell the story of the guest at least? Now I use it not just for the guest, but I work with my TAs pretty closely. Like, okay, when I'm talking about this, let's put this up there. If I'm talking about Kurt Flood and the history of free agency, let's let's have some good visuals of who Kurt Flood was because nobody out there has very likely ever even heard of Kurt Flood, as great a player as he was. So let's make sure that that we're keeping students engaged. And I ask them questions a lot mm -hmm. when we're talking about a subject like the uh, the NBA China controversy recently. What, what do you what do you guys what do you guys think about that? Do do you think that professional sports leagues and college conferences should be in business uh, with countries that don't align with our uh, political beliefs and um, you know? foundational philosophies. How should the NBA repair this relationship? Uh, one of my classes, I it's a lot smaller. I, I break them up into groups to discuss it and then report back. But I like to engage them and make them stop and think. So I'll just ask them. And, you know, and you probably won't be surprised to hear this is when, you, when, when we're talking about sports, People have opinions. Absolutely. And, and the sports talk industry is a pretty thriving one in this country. And we live in a time in all areas of discourse where it's about opinions and weighing in. And, you know, we have networks to reflect whatever opinion you want to be uh, you, that you like to hear expressed left or right in politics and sports. So students aren't afraid to to express themselves. And that's what keeps a class going. And believe it or not, Sergio, I, I go into a class three and a half hours and, and I'll sometimes wonder, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to get this in or that in or this. And that's a good feeling. Cause I always, you know, I believe strongly in, and as you know, in, in, in being prepared, being over-prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's 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 hugely important to any success you might hope to have, I think, in a classroom, let alone a classroom with, you know, 75 or 100 students is that feeling that you've got a lot to get to and you may not be able to get to it all. And that's that's generally what I sort of feel every week. Like, good. I, I think we're going to it's going to be a challenge to get to to get to all of this. Uh, but we I keep it moving. I try to make it, you know, I, I don't I don't give them a break. That sounds really harsh, <laughs> but first of all, if they want to get up and go to the restroom or whatever, go and take a call or something, they, they can do that. They don't need to ask permission, but although, although many of them do, which is very nice, but um, uh, I don't take a break because I feel like you lose momentum when you do that. If I say, all right, let's come back in 10 or come back in 15 or something. I used to do that between the portion that was just with me in the class before a guest would arrive, get them mic'd up. That'd be a good time to break. But I, I don't like the idea of maybe them saying, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty late. It's a long day. Maybe, maybe I'll just get the notes from a friend and I won't stay for the, the guest portion of the class. I, I don't want to give them that opportunity because they're going to miss something really special, I believe. So we just go, we just transition right into the segment with the guests and, you know, some might leave for some reason. Most of the time they've checked with me in advance. But um, before you know it, once we get going with, with guests and telling their stories, their life journeys, I think it's interesting enough that you look up and believe it or not, it's been, it's 
been almost three hours. So I, I really focus, and I do this with my podcast, I really focus on the life journey. That's something that I get excited about. That's the story that I like to tell of the, uh, the guests that I have is how did you get from, I almost always start off with the guest of, okay, when you were in their seats, mm -hmm. those students out there, what were you thinking about what your career might look like? And if it was going to be in sports, you hoped, what did you think it would be? And what does it make you feel like when you look out and you see those students that are so hopeful about having a career in sports like you have? And that's always a good starting place. And I, and I really enjoy telling the story of the journey. Yeah. And I mean, I think that the, the, uh, the journey that many of your guests have been on has been absolutely incredible. And I, I'm just curious. I mean, you mentioned prep. Right. And being yeah. over. Can I, can, I, can I tell you one quick journey Please story? Do. Just Please. because it, it's one I always bring up to illustrate. So, my friend Daryl Dunn is the general manager of the Rose Bowl. D done a great job. He's been there now, it's been I think, close to 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Daryl went to college at St. Bonaventure, which is also the college of the, of the great Bob Lanier, whose daughter is uh, Kalia, is a volleyball star at USC. Bob Lanier, former number one pick in the NBA draft, 6'11 center, you know, strong like Shaq was strong at a time when he didn't have that many guys of that, you know, of kind of, of, of that larger than life type presence. So Daryl is at St. Bonaventure and he's um, interested in becoming a sports writer. He starts out after he leaves uh, on the East Coast, a couple small papers and didn't like it. So he calls his brother who's in Santa Monica and says, can I just come out and live with you for a while and try to figure, figure it out? So he gets a job selling season tickets for the Lakers and Kings when they both played at the Forum pre-Staples. And it was one of those cutthroat, like you sell a certain amount of season tickets or you don't work here past that next month. It was that cutthroat. Um, just like death of a salesman, that same, same kind of thing, uh, with selling insurance or whatever. Um, and he did well enough that he continued to advance. And then he moved over and got a job selling season tickets for the Raiders when they were in L.A. before they returned to Oakland. And then from there, it was um, an opportunity at the Rose Bowl before the World Cup in 94. And then the Women's World Cup came four years later. And Daryl was at the Rose Bowl and continued to stay there to work on events and just kept working his way up the ladder to one day he becomes the general manager. He... He runs the, he's a very important person in the city of Pasadena, mm -hmm. a lot of politics when you're in Pasadena and anything, you know, you, you do, especially sports related with the Rose Bowl game and parade. And so I bring up the example and Daryl's a, a, a frequent guest. Do you think when Daryl Dunn was sitting in a classroom at St. Bonaventure, a small Catholic school in upstate New York, he figured, you know, one day I'll probably, I'll probably run the Rose Bowl. Right. It's probably what I'll, you know what, that, that's the vision I see for myself. I'll run, who would even know that at the Rose, the Rose Bowl, which is known for one event a year, UCLA didn't move there till 82 football, but one event a year, the Rose Bowl, who would even know that there's somebody who has a full-time job running this venue? That's how little we knew about details about sports business at one time. And so that was Daryl Dunn's journey from upstate New York in a classroom there in St. Bonaventure to Southern California because he didn't like writing about sports. And so like those kinds of stories, um, which don't appear in most in most uh, in, in books, typically. Right. Unless that unless that guest has written a, a book. Um Ned Coletti wrote a great one called The Big Chair about uh, advancing to the big chair of a, a baseball general manager. And he has an incredible story of his own journey. So those are the stories that I love to tell. They're not only great stories, but there are so many life lessons to learn along the way about how those people got from there to here. So many follow-up questions there. <laughs> so many. Let's go with uh, one of the things I've always been curious about, just as far as your guests go. What's what's the common thread, if any? I I think just knowing that they had a place somewhere in sports. Ned Coletti, interestingly, I just mentioned him. He started out as a sports writer too, 
and had and enjoyed it. Actually, had 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 more success. Daryl Dunn just didn't like the work Ned did, but Ned returned to Chicago to be closer to his ailing father, and and there was a job open um, opening with the Chicago Cubs, and he got the job. That's a great story by itself, um, but um, and a great lesson. Um, but he wanted to be working somewhere in sports and it ended up being in communications and PR for the Cubs. And then he had a chance to switch over to the business side and did, and then was on the general manager track. I would say the common thread is, is a belief that they had a place somewhere. I don't think most people that I've met in sports knew exactly what they wanted to do when they started. I would say the one area in sports where that maybe is the exception where you get a lot of people that will say, I knew when I was, you know, 12 years old, what I was going to do or, or something is sports broadcasters. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the kids that were taking tape recorders to stadiums and sitting up where nobody could hear them and just recording their voice and, you know, things like that. Um, One of my, one of my students, Jonathan Horowitz, uh, his goal came out of Orange County. He was sitting in my class as a freshman, and his goal was he told me he wanted to be a horse racing announcer. You know, as in, down the stretch they come. Here's Sergio on the outside. Come in. That's what he wanted to do for a living. And so he wasn't that far from the Los Alamitos racetrack in Orange County, and he, and he managed to talk his way into a letting them, uh, letting him, uh, call Jonathan call a race at Los Alamitos. I think he'd, he'd done a couple of demo tapes. And so they heard him and liked his voice and his command. So they let him do one of their eight races one night at Los Alamitos quarter horses. And so he was able to have that on his demo reel. And lo and behold, a few years later, uh, leaves USC and starts exploring opportunities. And it's not a, it's not a, profession, horse racing announcer, where you make a full-time living most of the time, but but he wanted to do that. And lo and behold, Jonathan Horowitz became the voice of Arapahoe Park in Denver. And uh, he did that for, gosh, five, six years. He's still in Denver. He's doing a couple other things, including teaching sports media and sports business classes at Metro State, which I'm I'm thrilled because now I- I'm sure you're very proud. Very proud and exchange the- um, I frequently exchange information about um, things to to be cognizant of and in developments in sports business. Like I talk to him now as a colleague, and um, uh, so uh, I, I don't know if it happens very often where you have a very specific goal. Um, mine at one time was maybe to become an NBA general manager, but you 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 know the twists and turns in life as we all embark on this life journey um, are so, are so varied and so profound, I think, especially in sports, because it's, there's a certain level of excitement and energy because of the competition, the games that, that you feed off of. And so it's, it's, it's exhilarating to be in the, in the space somewhere in sports, no matter what you're, kind of your role is you still feel the the energy from from the games you're connected to the games in some way i'm connected still just because we we follow them so closely talking Mm -hmm. about the business of sports so whatever it is um it's very likely that you didn't start out thinking that maybe that's what you were going to do but i tell my students all the time if you look at this time here at USC, at any university, this is where you can start to build your network, build your foundation brick by brick. So let's talk about that. What advice for somebody who knows that they want to get into sports, what advice do you have for them as far as building their network goes? It, it, it truly is. This is on my, on my keys to success. Uh, I say it's all about relationships. Um, it's hard to get somewhere in sports if you haven't built uh, a network of some kind, even mm-hmm. if it's just one or two key people. They may be people that can can help unlock doors. But the more people that you bring into that network, the greater chance there is that 
you can tap into that network at some point. Um, the number one, uh, when I on my keys to success, key number one is make yourself invaluable. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, I didn't have that on my original list of you know ten or so keys. One day I said, you know, that makes so much sense. Make yourself invaluable. I just stuck it in there, number four or five, and then maybe a year or so later I go, are you kidding me? That's the most important thing. There's, n- it, it just means that whatever you're doing, whatever your role is, and you would know Sergio as someone that operates a um, an event, the NBA Summer League for Hall Pass Media with Albert Hall and, and Warren Legary, that there's so many parts, moving parts, if you find someone who you f- believe, and of course it starts with with you guys, you have made yourself incredibly invaluable because of the work you do and the preparation before and during and even after. Um, so imagine if you if if everybody that worked for you, if their number one thing was we want to be most important is to be invaluable to you, and I and I and I think you probably get that kind of buy-in from the people who work for you. Like that's the key. What? Yeah. Whatever they need to do to be valuable to you guys, they do. Well, that's what I think is the most important lesson to know is whether it's an internship, whether it's a part-time job, whether it's just a one-off event, whether it's a full-time career. If you make yourself invaluable invaluable to your employer, then to me, you've that's the gold standard. Absolutely. So that's where I, I start with that and building relationships and just, I call it value add. What's your value add? Uh, what, how do you separate from the pack? How do you find, uh, what do you believe makes you good at what you do? I mean, what is, uh, what is it that you, that you bring to the table? And again, I, I say, what is your value add? Um, Casey Wasserman pointed out one day in class, it was such valuable information uh, years ago. He goes, you know what really impressed me in an interview? Instead of telling me how badly you want the job, I know that because that's why you're interviewing for mm-hmm. it. And by the way, I also know that you're passionate. Uh, I assume that. That's why you're applying. And I also know that you probably work hard. Can't imagine you applying for a, a job that's, you know, a hard to get job that's where it's competitive That if, if you're not a hard worker. So I know all that. Why don't instead you tell me what what's in it for me? Like what you will bring to the table? Why should I hire you? How will you help my company become more successful? And it, you think, well, isn't that sort of what you're always explaining? Not necessarily, because because people sometimes get caught up in telling you how much they, you know, let's just say if you were applying for a job with the Dodgers and they, you would go on and on, not you, but someone. Uh, of how much you know about the Dodgers. I can tell you every every um, every pitcher that's ever won 20 or more games for the, Do- for the Dodgers. I can tell you everyone that's won an right. MVP. Every, you know, going on and on. Like to tell you, like nobody knows the Dodgers better than I do. Nobody's a bigger fan of right. the Dodgers. That's a red flag, by the way, to, that you are going to come across as a fan because an employer is like, oh, geez, so that means, are they, did they become starstruck if I asked them to go pick up you know, uh, Clayton Kershaw at the airport or whatever. So rather than tell me why this would be such a great fit for you, Casey Wasserman was saying, why don't you tell me what your value add, what, why I should hire you and what are you bringing to the table for me? And it's, it's not selfish because if you're going to hire someone and bring them in and into your, into your company, and have them become part of your team. I'm always saying, you know, think of it as you're joining a team. You got to fit in. It's not just like who knows the most about that subject. It's what kind of person are you? How would you fit in? Mm-hmm. So, so I, I, I also I'm I'm really big on life experiences. You know, I talk about life journeys. What what are some of your life experiences? Do you speak another language? Have you traveled? I'm really big on travel because I think it it helps someone mature, and you deal with situations. You. You know, I was in Rome once and I lost everything. I left it on a bus. I lost my wallet. I lost all my money. I lost my credit cards, driver's license, and passport. I, I hit it. You know, it was like the, you know, the, I checked every box of something that was valuable to lose. And my address book, which at the time pre 
cell phones pre-internet it was yeah it was it was probably the most it was the most valuable thing maybe of anything i lost other than maybe the passport was all of my addresses and phone numbers but you know what they i was in a big city which helped but there are steps you can take you can go to the embassy you can start to you know, take the steps you this make, is problem solving yeah you you got to call home you got to get money wired you you know you eventually kind of kind of funny when i got home a month after I was home, my address book showed up. Somebody had seen my address on the book and just put it in the mail and it showed up at home. Um, so travel gives you life experiences. So do you, you know, do you, um, do you, do you have you done work for charitable organizations, Special Olympics or something that you, um, that you think has helped you know, build you in some way. Internships. Uh, internships, huge. I mean, I, we, we pound that into students. I think they do it everywhere as internships. Um, just do something. Put, yep. Get something down there where you can show some experience. Give someone a reason to choose you for a job. And and if you don't, if you're an athlete that's that's been practicing and hasn't even had an opportunity to an internship, well, you know what? Then you have to emphasize something different. If you're an athlete who's been on teams this time while others have are doing internships, then you talk about teamwork. You talking about talk about discipline, talk about go the extra mile. Leadership. Leadership. Huge. So you 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 know, you certainly play to your strengths. Um, but I think I think a common thread is you want to be invaluable and in doing whatever you have time to do. Uh, and and my guests many times have told my students, hey, if you want to just come and see us as we as we put an event on, my friend Caitlin Banchero works for Street League Skateboarding. So they do events all the time. You want to just come to, she's on the business side of at, at Street League. Do you want to just come and come to one of our events? Uh, I'll put you to work. Or do you want to just come and watch? Um, so it's amazing how often those kinds of opportunities really are offered. My guests are great about saying, hey, if, if I can help and uh, or if you want to just come and shadow me, yeah. if it's Shelly Smith or a reporter, want to just watch watch me work and prepare, feel free to do that. And they, they're almost all, because again, I think everybody remembers when someone offered that opportunity to them in their lives. And so they want to, they want to return the favor and continue this, continue with the good, the good karma in the circle. Yeah, I think there's there's no question the opportunities are out there. It's just a matter of whether, you know, whether or not people step up to take that extra step. And that, I think, is really what defines, you know, whether or not you make yourself invaluable, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. people who are invaluable are people who've had a lot of experiences, like you said. To have experiences, you need to put yourself out there and you need to do things. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So how how, I mean, your job is to make people believe, you know, you've got your four keys to success, right? You've got dream big, make yourself invaluable, never get outworked, treat people well. Do you feel like your guests are the mechanism through which you're able to teach those lessons? Like, how do you get people to believe that those are the things that they need to do? Um, I, I think just reinforcing it constantly. Mm -hmm. The ones you just mentioned are, are actually what I, 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 I call them my bonus keys to success. I, I started saying those four things at the end of the semester as just the, my kind of my final thoughts and um, ending it with treating people well, because it's funny, it's something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised how often someone will say, you know, that person is a really good guy or, or she's a terrific person. Uh, like that really stands out if they're just a nice person. And so, so sometimes I think that that needs to get emphasized more, just being a good person. Uh, the hard work, I always say, look, very likely you're not going to be the most talented. A a any place you work, the odds are, if you're in a company with 100 people, you, you have a one in a, there's a one in 100 that that person, if they had to determine the hardest worker, or I'm sorry, the most talented would be you. If you, mm -hmm. if, you, if you are, great. But since the odds are you're not going to be the most talented, there's actually no reason why you couldn't be the hardest worker. No reason at all. I, I mean, you go make yourself the hardest worker. Now, and I always add, if you're the hardest worker and you're the most talented, well, then you're probably, you know, Kobe or 
Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky. Right, or that's when something Andrew, really special happens. Y- y- where you're, you don't even feel like you're working or you become completely um, devoted to something um, that you don't think of it as work. It's just what you do. So, so those things, uh, I think I just reinforce them a lot mm-hmm. about being invaluable. And I always ask my guests, almost always I ask my guests what their keys to success are. I've learned a lot from my guests as they have, as they've gone and just learned to now reveal those to my students. And I kind of take a note of some of the things that they've mentioned. I Stan I'm, Morrison. I can uh, imagine it's just a treasure trove. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 what's, well, it's great is because we're always evolving. We're always learning. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like every week in class, I'm learning something. That's another reason I love bringing in the, the guests I do is because I feel like it it gives me a chance to learn more. No question. And, and continue to evolve in what I do. I was saying my, my friend Stan Morrison, the former USC basketball coach, who's a dear friend and, and someone I think the absolute world of, longtime athletic director at UC Riverside. He's on 30 boards. He serves 30. 30, 3 Okay. And I always say, you know, if you ask him, he will come. That's Stan. He's just, he can't say no. And he's retired at, he just turned 80. And I, I put quotes around retired because he's the most uh, unretired, retired person I've ever met. He just gives of himself to a level that uh, is um, almost beyond belief. He always asks my class to consider two questions. And he asks, he used to, he, he used to ask his staff at UC Riverside, his coaches, and his administrative staff when he was athletic director there for uh, 12 years. Two questions to consider. Number one, in 30 words or less, what is your definition of success? Mm -hmm. In 30 words or less. Number two, what do you aspire to stand for as a human being? And he said- Love that. He said, wow. He goes, goes, you couldn't believe how that impacted my staff. He goes, I would have people come. He he said, "I, I don't need to have the answer right away. But just begin to think about, and at some point when you think you have an answer, come and see me. We'll sit down in my office and talk about it. And um, so it's it's important to know that it's not an easy answer. Neither one are easy, and neither one can can um, probably just come right out of you right away and boom, you have it. I mean, Coach Wooden took 14 years to build his pyramid of success. He'd, right. He'd work on it, put it in his in – his, desk at, at, at the office and then pick it up and write something again and tinkered with it and tweaked it. And 14 years later, he came up with the pyramid of success. But but Stan uh, just asks asked his staff to consider those questions. And so I do the same thing with my students. I, I test them on not their answers, but just to, to remember the questions. What are the two questions that Stan Morrison used to ask his staff? At uh, when he was athletic director at UC Riverside. And why does he believe those questions are important? The answer to that is he doesn't believe you can lead others until you can lead yourself and until you know, really know who you are. No question. So that's why I want them thinking about it because that might be something they could bring up someday in an interview as if somebody said, tell me about yourself. What do you believe in? You know, and somebody's asking that thinking, I'll get them. I'll I'll, you know, I'll stop them in their tracks with this question. Well, if you've be if you've been thinking about that, you you might have an answer that would just knock the socks off somebody. Well, let me tell you, well, I this is this is what I believe success is, mm-hmm. and I love Coach Wooden's definition of success, which is peace of mind, knowing that you've done essentially that knowing you've done the best and become the best that you could possibly become. You know, people have. Different ways of saying that, but Coach Wooden's definition includes the words peace of mind. Yeah. Because I think if you have peace of mind in whatever it is that that you are doing in life, you walk into a, a, a room to take an exam and you walk out going, I think I nailed it. I think I feel pretty good. You still might not get the grade that you thought. Maybe it's a little lower, but it might be a little better even sometimes. But when you have peace of mind, usually it means you you know you've prepared. Like I didn't catch, they didn't catch me off guard on anything, but um, it turns out I didn't answer the question enough to, uh, well enough to get an A, 
But I wasn't blindsided. I wasn't taken by surprise. I was prepared. I prepared the right thing. So I have peace of mind. So I always like that, that being part of um, a definition of success. But And to do it in 30 words or less, I thought was is a good challenge too, to be as succinct as possible, because I think you'll, I think it has a chance to stay with you longer if you can, if you can make it brief. Sure. And then, you know, and then the other part of what you aspire to stand for. So just to get students thinking and always asking my guests about, you know, what their keys were. Sometimes it's, it's told in a story, not necessarily a, a list, but that's how I think you get, that you get, um, maybe students to consider and and retain that information is they'll 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 just they'll just hear me talk about it mm-hmm. throughout the course of the semester and they'll hear various versions of a lot of the things that I say in my keys from the guests in their own words. Yeah, no, I think and I think the the piece on success so important, right? It's really the tough questions that are the most valuable. Right. I mean, you need to know everybody out there. You need to have some sort of understanding about what your definition of success is, Mm -hmm. at least at the time, so that you have something to aim at. Because when you have something to aim at, you can outline the steps to get there. Right. Right. If you don't have something to aim at, then you're kind of just floating around in the world, hoping that something happens. Right. And when when you're intentional. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think also you can also, it's also easier to determine if you're trying to, because I say this a lot to students, it's just as important as they try to find the right person and wonder if that's you, you need to decide if that's the right place for you to be. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way thing. Now, yes, their students are very anxious to get that job or first job, especially so they can tell their parents and their friends, yeah, I I got a job. I'm, I'm working now. But you know, it's most important. It's the right, it's the right job, not the dream job. You shouldn't be aspiring to and thinking you're going to get the dream job right out of right out of college that's why i would always encourage i always encourage students to to never tell someone for the you know when you're a year or two out of college and you're interviewing and you know this is my absolute dream job if your dream job is one you can interview for a year out of college well then what's what's the next job you need bigger dreams you need yeah you do. You need bigger dreams. Uh, so, uh, you know, yes, I, I say, um, you know, um, you, you, you are, uh, you need to decide whether you, if that's the, if that's the right place for you to be. And when you talk about your own definition of success, if you have it laid out, in, in pretty solid terms, you can determine whether your definition of success aligns with the company that you're interested in working for. So the, you know, the more you have it sort of carved out in your mind about what you're looking for, the easier it'll be to, to recognize whether you've connected with the right company that that is similarly aligned. Absolutely. And I think that ties into just being passionate, right? I mean, if your definition of success is aligned with the job you're looking to get into, right, or that you're ap- applying for, then you'll be passionate about what you're doing. No, right? there's no question. I, I have what I call my four P's, um, and it starts with passion. I put them in a particular order, passion, preparation, performance, and persistence. I had three P's for a while, and then I added the fourth, and the fourth is persistence. But passion fuels everything. The MVP, my most valuable P, is preparation, because I think that is absolutely most important, uh, that you feel prepared, that you're ready to go. Performance, because it's a bottom line business, sports is. I mean, if you're not doing the job on the field or the court, the ice, whatever it is, you get replaced. And if similarly, the the jobs in sports are usually very competitive to get, and you got to deliver. So that's performance. And then persistence, I think, sort of ties everything in together. You have to be persistent Mm -hmm. to get the job. And then when you have the job, you got to be really persistent to execute it properly. So um, those Ps start with persistence. I I, I say that should be a fundamental component. That's why I say don't, don't go overboard in, in telling someone you're interviewing with that you have passion 
because if I'm interviewing you, I'm I better uh, feel strongly that you have it without even. You asking. shouldn't have to say it. You, you really shouldn't. It should come across in your resume. It should come across in a first interview, maybe over the phone. By the time we get to the the stage of being in person and really getting close, there should be no question that you, that you have passion. So. I think it needs to be included and part of of who you are and how you present yourself, but don't go overboard because that's 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 a fundamental component. Absolutely. I'm getting worried here. I mean, we could talk for, for hours. <laughs> I'm looking at my notes here, wondering where to take this next yeah. because there's so much we could talk about, but um, I want to switch gears slightly just to different philosophies that I know that you have. One of them that I think you you got from Coach Wooden is make each day your masterpiece. Love it. I love that. So, Mike, and I know you do this, and I know you practice this. My question is how? How do you encourage your students to do so, the people around you to do so? What, what did Co- Coach Wooden say about it? Well, first of all, he, you know, he actually got that from his dad, from uh, Joshua uh, Wooden. They called him Hugh. And that was on a piece of paper that he handed him one day when he was, Coach Wooden, I think, was a teenager working in the fields in Indiana where he grew up in the farm. And he just, on a piece of paper, he just had these, what he called a seven point creed of just sort of thoughts that his dad had about things that maybe could help you become successful in life. So he handed his son a piece of paper. I asked Coach Wooden one day, do, do, you, do you, think your, you think your dad would, how do you think your dad would feel if he knew how often that that piece of paper that he handed his son on a farm in Indiana in the 1920s how many people had benefited from the suggestions around the world? And you know what he said? He thinks it for a second. He goes, I think he'd be pleased. <laughs> that was that was like Coach Wooden. You know, that's about uh, about how typically excited he might might get. But I just, I, I like it because you, you don't have any control of what happened yesterday. You don't have any control of what's going to happen tomorrow. But you have, you have a, a fair amount of control over, over what, you do with your day. Sometimes it becomes a little out of your control sometimes, but, but you can, you can make the best out of every day. You, whatever the circumstances are, you can make the best out of it. And, and you, you can make it a masterpiece. I remember talking to Pete Carroll about it that one night in class and he had a reputation, has a reputation of like super Mr. Positive, super upbeat all the time. And, and, and so I asked him, Pete, have you ever had a bad day? And I'm someone myself that I never even think of those words, bad day. Uh, and I, so I asked Pete, and he, and he looked at me like I, I was speaking in a foreign language. He goes, bad day. He goes, and this guy's been fired twice. I mean, you know, you move around a lot as a coach when you're yeah, young. Bad you, things have happened to yeah, him I mean, by normal people's definitions. Right. But. I mean, you might have thought that in that Super Bowl and, yeah. you know, when uh, – um, you know, in the interception against the Patriots happened at the goal line. I mean, does that become a bad day? I don't know. Pete looked at a bad day. And he goes, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. And then you realize it, it, how, how much it's about how you look at something, mm-hmm. how you look at, it. was that loss to the Patriots that could have made history? The, the teams that win back to back Super Bowls, it's so rare. It puts you in another, another universe. Uh, no, I, I think Pete, and he handled himself with his usual grace after the loss in the locker room. I was very interested how he would handle that adversity because uh, I thought he he's so good about being patient with reporters and the media. And I thought he'll probably lose it. This will be the one time that, that he'll just snap. Nope, never did. Never did. I think he looked at it as a personal challenge to not do that. I think personal challenge, and I think... If you look at losing or failure as a way to learn something, then it's 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 just a lesson learned, yeah. right? It's no. not a bad day. It's not something bad that happened. It's just something didn't go your way. Yep. And it's a way to learn a different way to approach something. Yeah, and I think if you look at the bigger picture, which is you know kind of what you're saying here in the in the context, you're in the Super Bowl in this case. Mm-hmm. You didn't win it, but you're in the Super Bowl. That's why, like, I mean, I it was it was it hurt as following the Dodgers as long as I have. 
I thought this was a year that they could win the World Series. They mm-hmm. didn't make it. And people say, oh, they're going to become the Buffalo Bills. They're, you know, they're, oh, are they ever going to? I'm like, you think the Buffalo Bills would be okay if they got back to the point of going to four consecutive Super Bowls? Now, I know you, it's tough when you don't win any of the four. And the Dodgers went to back to back World Series and lost both. But they, it, it, it was, it's, it was, it's been an incredible ride each of the last three years in the case of the Dodgers. They've had, Arguably, the three best teams they've they've ever had in Los Angeles. You could argue they uh, certainly going back to the to early mid '60s. They didn't win the World Series, but boy, it was a fun ride. And I don't look at that thing as well. If you you, you get there and you don't win at all, it's a failure. I don't I don't think of it like that. You didn't reach the ultimate goal, but it doesn't mean the journey itself was a failure. The journey the journey was a blast, and I bet Pete Carroll would say the same thing. We had a blast that year. Won the NFC championship, just didn't, just didn't finish it. But so, so much about, uh, you know, just how you look at it, how you frame it. And is it always a masterpiece? Well, maybe not in the way we, most people look at a masterpiece, but, but that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Let's see how close we can get to having a day where we said, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good day. I got a little bit better at something, you know, or I was able to, you know, touch someone in a way that really, um, that they were kind enough to share with me. I, I, and I think when you're in, in teaching and education of any kind, you, you, you're fortunate to get a few of those kinds of days where it's something someone says, or they applied something you taught, or they got a job they really were looking for and hoping to get. Um, so there's a lot of ways your day could become a masterpiece. It doesn't always involve you reaching a certain point where you get a trophy or you're honored in some way. Just helping someone get somewhere, you know, helping someone get where, you know, you, you know Coach Raveling says this. I mean, you'll, you'll get where you want to go by helping someone get where they want to go that it comes back to you. Couldn't agree more. Make each day your masterpiece. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I believe in that. So we're starting to run out of time here. I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions. Sure. But the, the, the answers certainly don't need to be rapid fire. Okay, I'll do my best. Up to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? I would say to be as focused as possible on your career, um, not thinking that it will all happen in time. Like sometimes I I look back, I think I could have, I could have applied myself even more than I did and not thinking that, um, as I said, it'll, you know, I'll get to it. I'll, I'll, we'll we'll get there. I'll, I'll, it'll, it'll work out. Like, one good thing that I've noticed, if I've seen a trend among students, they 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 hit the ground. They tend to hit the ground running when they come to to college. I see that with my USC students. Like, used to be, I think you, you a year. You know, you, you take a year to get used to college life. You have some fun, and now it's you're a junior or senior. Yeah, hey, you probably should get an internship now. Like, I'm seeing a lot more students arrive at USC as freshmen or sophomores. Like, they want to meet and talk about what they can do to get themselves in a position to get the job they want. So that's a better way to approach it. Not to the point of excluding fun from your life, but just to be serious about with an eye on life after college. And I, I probably was, I probably didn't have, even though I was a pretty serious student um, to, to really zero in on things that, that maybe could have, Push me along. Mm-hmm. And just to tell a personal story here, I remember, so I transferred here to USC uh-huh. uh, from yeah, Park College. And I remember when I, when I got here, I thought, man, I've really got it made. I'm here at USC. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to get the job of my dreams. But then you start looking around, right, at what everybody else is doing. And man, I mean, people are serious here, right? Like you said, internships, student organizations, people getting 4.0s. 
And, you know, I don't really know what it's like on other campuses across the country, but that's one of the benefits of going to a really good school, academic school, is you you really figure out what it takes to win, right? So for me, I, I got here, started looking around thinking, well, you know, I don't know. How many people graduate from USC a year? Do you know roughly? You know, I, do, I don't know what that number is. Let's say uh, tens of thousands. Let's say 10,000. Okay. 10, okay. I, you know, out of those 10,000, quite a few of them are doing a lot more than just going to school. Right. And if you want to compete, right. And you want to, like you said earlier, make yourself invaluable, you better pick it up. Yeah. And so that was one of the wake up calls for me is really just, you know, being amongst really good talent, Mm -hmm. people who were smart, right. Everybody who's here is smart. A lot of people are going to graduate. And it was just a matter of looking around and understanding what the competition was. And yeah. I think that was one of the that's, that's one, one of the benefits to, uh, you know, to coming here to USA. And, and the other thing is, is Sergio, is you, you've got you've got like this much time. I'm putting my thumb and forefinger very close to each other. You, you don't really have much time, even the four years. And I say this to students and they'll always tell me at the end. Like, even though I know you said that and my parents said that, it, it was still hard for me to believe it would go as fast as it's gone. So you think you've got all the time in the world. You don't have it. So when I hear students that I feel like they arrive ready to go, let's let's get after it, as Chris Cuomo says. Let's get after it. I love that, too. Uh, I'm finding a lot of students really, really mean that. And that's and that's really good because. You, you, you gotta, you gotta go, you gotta get, you gotta get started because the competition in sports for the jobs that are there, there, it's just, it's never been more fierce. And I think that comes from just going back to what we were talking about earlier about success Mm -hmm. and knowing what success looks like for you, even if it's at this stage in your life, if you know what success looks like for you, then you can get after it, right? You can hit the ground running. Right. Whereas if you've never asked yourself those questions, right, where do I want to go? You don't really know where you're running to. You don't know you, where you're running you the to. the ground running, but you don't really know where you're headed to. You're right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely uh, definitely something that everybody listening to, especially if you're in college, spend the time to do the deep work. I think that's yeah. And when, when and Coach Morrison mentioned that, I thought of that so many times, like how it'd be interesting to find out, ask your parents or people that have, that have lived a good chunk of their life. Like, has anybody ever asked you what your definition of success is? Did anybody bring that up and say, I want you to give me an answer at some point? Or in the other, in the other question is what do you aspire to stand for as a human being? Wouldn't it be refreshing to be able to talk to someone in a job interview and have them tell you what their definition of success was? And here they are in their early twenties or mid twenties or whatever. That's not, Coach Morrison was getting getting this dumbfounded look from people that had never been asked the question that were in their, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever. So the earlier you can get at that, and if it takes 14 years to come up with your answer like it did Coach Wooden to finish his pyramid of success, so be it. But at least you're thinking about it. And when it comes up in conversation, you'll have some, you know, you'll have some something you can offer. And I think you'd have a chance to be a better you and then ultimately to be able to offer more of a value add for a company. No question. It just, it allows you, when you know what your definition of success is, it allows you to live in alignment and in t- with intention and really do the things that you're passionate about, right? And that will come across in your work uh-huh. and that will come across in basically every aspect of your life. I've got this quote Um, that I really like related to questions related to the Stan Morrison story. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions you ask. Wow. By Tony Robbins. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, And I think, I think there, I think you can wrap preparation into that, Mm -hmm. which of course I, you know, I value um, more than any of my other suggestions is just, is, is being prepared. Um, but yeah, I think it it means you've studied and you've you've prepared and and uh, you've thought about and you you've learned enough about your your subject, the person you're questioning, that that you're ready for um, to ask something that can be of value to you. And so it's it's important. To, it's really important to 
to zero in on those questions that will provide answers that are going to be really meaningful to you and your audience, in my case, my students. Absolutely. Um, next rapid fire question. <laughs> I don't know. What's the gonna... book or podcast yeah. or uh, video that you've seen recently um, that's impacted you the most and why? It doesn't have to be recent. Just if you've, if you've got a suggestion for books or podcasts, videos, anything that you would encourage every sports business hopeful to read, listen to, love to hear about yeah, it. Yeah, I, um, gosh, I, I don't know if there's, if there's been, if there's been one that, um, that jumps out. I get asked, I have a pretty long list of books that I recommend. Um, I think, I think the one I mention most to students and I've read bits and pieces from, but what I have read, I've really enjoyed is Shoe Dog, Phil Knight's story, mm -hmm. Building Nike. I, I, I've, I've recommended that and haven't gone cover to cover with it, but enough that, that um, I feel like the, 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 the benefits are huge from, you know, in leadership and business. And I, and, and I know those, a lot of those stories well enough. I think that's the one I've found myself recommending most. I go to a, I go to a lot of movies. I don't go to as nearly as many during the school. This, the fall is my busier of the two semesters, but so I'm a little behind. Um, I would say, I would say the, 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 the Coach Wooden book that I mentioned that I referenced earlier, um, just called Wooden by Steve Jamison. I, I, I call that the, the, the gift that keeps on giving mm -hmm. because you can open up any pages and you can find something of value. And boy, it's, when you think about it, how often can you say that about any, any book or publication? You can just open it and there's going to be something of value on every page. So it's just, it's got all the, all the observations, the beliefs, um, the woodenisms, um, and the anecdotes and stories that you may be, it's all in one place. Came out about, I think it's been about 20 years now. I think it was 98. Um, so I would say I have given that, I've given that book out to so many people as gifts over Including the years. Including myself. I mean, just because I feel like, as I said, it's the the gift that keeps on giving. You can you can reference it any time, and there's so much, there's so many life lessons there, and they weren't. It wasn't set up when Coach Wooden said these things to be life lessons necessarily. These were just things that he wanted to pass along that had been helpful to him mm -hmm. from his originally maybe from his dad, like we the Seven Point Creed, but. Otherwise, just things that he's, you know, that he's believed in that like one, one that doesn't get ever talked about too much. I brought it up the other night at an, an event I, I was, um, I was emceeing with, with Bill Walton as the special guest is there's no such thing as, um, as, uh, well, you, we, we, we talk about, um, somebody being, um, we talk about some, something being undervalued um, and somebody describes a person or a team as an overachiever. You hear that a lot. A bunch of hardworking overachievers. Like Coach Wooden said once, there's no such thing as an overachiever. How can you achieve beyond your ability to achieve? Like, you, you know, it also speaks to when coaches say, give me 110%. Well, Really, I, I can give you 100%. Right. Because if because I would say if you give 110, how come you can't give 120? If you give 120, I, I love that. Give, how about just give 100? And and by the way, if you achieve something, you are capable of achieving it. And and one of the and one of the uh, students from it was at, this event was at La Sierra University came up to me afterwards, and that was the thing he wanted to talk about. He goes, "Man, that that just hit home somehow." As because uh, I said, like as an athlete, don't let Somebody tell you, hey, you guys, it was so great to see you're a bunch of overachievers. What? No, what it probably means is your expectations for me weren't high enough. Uh, your expectations were here. We were able to do this. Therefore, we overachieved. No, no. I think you underestimated us. Right. So that's kind of on you. Like, 
I, I, and, I, and I told this, this student, I said, if you grew up to be president of the United States, I don't know, you, you, you might. I'm not going to tell you you overachieved. You were capable of it and you did it. Mm-hmm. So um, that's one of the ones in the, that, in the book that, that just sort of, I, I read it and I just popped out at me because I hear the term used so often in sports, uh, overachieved. And uh, I'm not buying it. So I always tell my students, would you help me stamp out the word overachieved, please? When you think of the word successful, who is the first person who comes to mind and why? I don't. Is, is there one person? Uh, I, I'd say probably I, maybe it would be Coach Wooden again I, because he's got the he's got the two prong thing. Mm-hmm. He's got the actual success in terms of accomplishments of his teams, his teams. I never say he won. Uh, you know, John Wooden won. He didn't win. 10 national championships or seven in a row, his teams did that he led. So I always say, you know, so coach Wooden led uh, teams to 10 national championships, including seven in a row, 88 in a row, 88 games in a row, his teams won. Um, so yeah, it's just mind boggling to think about um, Bill Walton the other night I, in doing my research, introducing him. I didn't realize between his time at Helix high in San Diego Freshman team at UCLA before freshmen were eligible to play varsity. So he had to play on the freshman team. And then his first two years, he, they were 30 and 0 both years, um, junior, sophomore, junior. And then they lost a few games as a senior when he was a senior. Um, his teams won 142 games in a row, high school, college. Wow. 142 games in a row his teams won. Uh, Mind boggling. Yeah, it, it really is. So, but, but what I think of when a coach wouldn't is two pronged, the actual success that, that most people use to determine like his teams won championships, but it was the fact that he was successful. I mean, he lived in a modest condominium in Encino that looked out on an alley for, for the last 30 plus years of his life could have moved into a bigger place and, Something would have represented. He could have lived just about wherever he wanted. Yeah, to. and he was comfortable there. He was comfortable in a cramped study and a living room, modest size. He walked into his place in the hallway and started to walk down. You know, and there's a little, there's a little like plastic tree or something. And there's a. I remember walking by there, and there was a metal. There was like a, you know, it was a, a, a you know, there was some kind of an award, you know, and it, like a chain or ribbon or something attached to a ribbon. Uh, What's this? Oh, it's the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That's the highest honor a U.S. civilian can receive. And it was just hanging. He just tried to find a place for it, so he just put it on this little plastic tree in the hallway. So, I mean, so there's there's a good example. of So there's the success of being a Presidential Medal of Freedom awardee, Mm -hmm. but there's some success in the fact that he didn't look at it as a way to define who he was. That was something he was given for his accomplishments, but that wasn't necessarily uh, what he needed to define success. So that's, I, I always look at how he lived his life and having this extraordinary success in the way it's typically viewed which is, you know, we're all caught up in the how many rings you have and the, and the players in sports all talk about rings. You don't really talk about that um, because sometimes when you have peace of mind, you don't always win, but you still have peace of mind, and that's a pretty good way to measure success. This next one comes from our very good mutual friend, Coach Raveling. Can you sum yourself up in one word? Boy, <sighs> I don't do do too many things ever in one word, uh, <laughs> as you know. Um, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you one. Uh, grateful. Grateful. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was a word that my friend Todd Lehman. Um, I, I heard him use that word 
more and more in the course of his life, um, somebody that I've admired that worked with me and for me when I was doing my Pete Newell Challenge event. We talk, we talk a lot about these subjects, life lessons. And, and um, he signs a lot of his emails gratefully. And I've started to do that too, because I feel, um, I feel just really so grateful. I guess blessed is another one I would, I would say blessed mm -hmm. uh, or grateful. I, I go to either one, of, either one of those two grateful to continue to get uh, opportunities. Uh, I'm a person of faith. So, um, you know, I, I do give thanks and um, just to be able to, you know, and I try to bring this to the attention of my students sometimes, um, you know, coach Wooden has this, you know, give thanks and for the blessings you have is like, sometimes we don't realize how, you know, lucky we are. You get caught up in things and you don't always get what you were hoping and you get bummed out. And, and then I bring up Louis Zamperini, another frequent guest in my class who survived 47 days at sea without food or water, survived a plane crash that killed everybody except three out of his, what, 12, I think that were 11 or 12 that were on that, in that plane that crashed. 47 days without food or water, a uh, couple years in a prisoner of war camp, in Japan, and um, survived it, survived it all. Uh, so I say when I tell them about Louis Zamperini's story and they see a film about him, I said, does that kind of put, when we're done, I said, does that put in perspective when you think you've had a bad day? No, I think that we talked about that with Pete Carroll mm -hmm. earlier. Um, so I, I feel really, I feel really, grateful and blessed to have the opportunity to do what I do and to be surrounded by so many extraordinary people. Co-traveling also says, surround yourself with extraordinary people as often as possible. And I feel like I'm so grateful that so often I find myself surrounded by extraordinary people. You know, the other night when I was on stage with Bill Walton, and then at one point with Stan Morrison, two people I have the utmost admiration for. And I'll catch myself going, yeah, this is pretty cool. Uh, I was taking Coach Wooden up back from dinner one night. He was in the front seat, and Ed Guthman was in the back. Ed Guthman, a colleague of mine at USC, a professor and Pulitzer Prize winner, a reporter, Bobby Kennedy's press secretary. He was there when the first black student was admitted to... Um, University of Mississippi, James Meredith. I mean, his footprints throughout history. Like he's in the back seat and Coach Wooden's in the front seat. And I'm driving going, well, you better drive really carefully. You got some really valuable cargo in this car. Like how lucky am I? Um, and I feel that way right now, sitting across from you. Uh, another extraordinary person. Well, this has been amazing, Jeff. I think this is a good place to stop. Thank you for giving us the time. I mean, for everybody listening, Jeff is, uh, we didn't, we didn't even, we covered so little. <laughs> I've got so many notes here and uh, we covered so little of what I wanted to cover. You came prepared. I appreciate your questions and the conversation and I appreciate more than anything, your friendship and support. Hey, I, I, uh, I appreciate your friendship as well and hope we can do this again sometime soon, to. Jeff. Thank you for having me as a, a guest. Thanks appreciate again it. for your time. Yep. My pleasure. And there you have it, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this interview with the wise and inspiring Jeff Fellinzer. If you learned anything or were inspired by the show, please make sure to share it with your friends, post it on social media, and subscribe and review. You can find the show notes for everything that was discussed on the show at sportsbusinessclassroom.com forward slash Jeff dash Fellinzer. That's J-E-F-F dash F E. L-L-E-N-Z-E-R. If you're enjoying the show, please let us know you're listening, share it with your friends, and help us spread the message of getting better each and every day. One more big thank you to our sponsors, Sports Business Classroom Online and Hall Pass Media, and thanks again for listening. We will see you next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience.